Jimmy Spoon and the Pony Express. Six, trouble. Roberts Creek Station was about 60 miles west of Ruby Valley. It looked like a ranch to Jimmy. A blacksmith was shoeing a mule, and several soldiers sat nearby cleaning their rifles. They all watched Jimmy admirably as he tossed the mochila, then walked his exhausted horse to the corral. The hostel was spacious inside, with wide plank floors and windows with curtains. Three long tables were, heavily, were heavy with breakfast and the elbows of overland travelers. Voices were loud and animated. Jimmy slumped onto one of the benches, too tired to remove his boots, but not too tired to smile at those around him. He was proud that so many people waved to him and shouted, Howdy, boy! On the floor next to him was a wooden box with a blanket and a sleeping baby inside. The baby had round pink cheeks that did not seem to be bothered by the noise. Jimmy tasted dried blood on his lips and felt with his tongue how parched his mouth was. Riding fast for five hours, even though he changed horses three times, was harder than he had thought it would be. His legs ached, and he knew they were raw in places. Remembering the bread Milo had given him, he reached into his shirt, but sweat had made the bread soggy. A woman with strong, tanned arms set a steaming bowl of oatmeal in front of Jimmy, butter pooled in its center, melting into clumps of brown sugar. "'You look wore out,' she said to him. "'I'm Mrs. Roberts, and that there is baby Lucy. Me and Tom are on Roberts Crick, and we're proud to have you boys stopped here. Meals are on the house.' From the center of the table, she took someone's plate of half-eaten bread and gave it to Jimmy. Then, searching among other dishes, she found a mug of unfinished milk. There are bits of chewed food floating on top, but Jimmy was so thirsty that he drank it straight down. He didn't remember being led to the bunkhouse or even stretching out. But someone was now shaking his shoulder, waking him from a deep sleep. In another instant, he was on a horse, still groggy, but carrying the male east under a blue cloudless sky, the warm afternoon sun on his back. This is the life, he thought. Cheers from stagecoach passengers rang pleasantly in his ears. Folks liked him. He was important. What he had failed to notice, however, was that the, was that the rider he replaced was pale with fright and had been unable to speak. Nor had Jimmy noticed that soldiers were forming ranks beyond the corral. When Jimmy sighted Sulphur Creek, he was just coming around a bluff and out of a dry riverbed. Wind blew the fine alakai dust into his eyes and mouth. Its salty taste made him even more thirsty. Jimmy was glad a fresh horse would be waiting, because this one was beginning to tire. It seemed odd, though, that the corral was empty with no one to greet him. Hello? Jimmy called. Cautiously, he dismounted, looping the reins around a post. His horse drank from a large bucket of water, and Jimmy cupped a drink for himself. Hello? He called again. Then a sudden force of someone grabbing him knocked Jimmy to the ground. But it was only a small boy whose tear-stained face pleaded silently with him. Whoa, what happened, fellow? Where's your pa? Still clinging to him, the boy led Jimmy inside, a man standing against the hearth, shivering in pain. The long shaft of an arrow protruded from his thigh. His eyes were glazed. When he saw Jimmy, he tried to speak, but his voice was hoarse. Paiutes, he whispered. Jimmy noticed a figure cowering in the corner. Someone he recognized as a fellow rider, but this boy rocked back and forth, whimpering. I quit. I'm playing quit, he sobbed. They killed Uncle. They just outright killed him. Jimmy forced himself to think. What was he to do? Gently prying the boy's small arms off his, he set him on a bunk and tucked a blanket around him, then hurried outside. He was shocked to see a dead man sprawled in the trough, red water seeping into the dirt. Tracks showed that one group of Indians headed north with the, swollen, with the stolen horses. With increasing alarm, Jimmy circled the corral, Nine, possibly twelve, Paiutes were, raiding, were riding east toward, the, toward Ruby Valley, toward his home station. He knelt down to feel the droppings. They were still warm. Jimmy knew this group was not far away. If he hurried, he might be able to skirt their trail and ride the fifteen miles to Ruby Valley in time to warn Milo and Mr. Tag. But what about the soldiers at Roberts Creek? Should he turn back and notify them instead? It would be getting dark soon, and the moon wouldn't be rising for several hours. Jimmy raced back to the cabin. This is going to hurt, he said to the station keeper kneeling beside him, but it'll be quick. we got to do it so you don't lose your leg. Before the man could protest, Jimmy had snapped the shaft in two and pushed the end with the arrowhead through the back of the thigh. The man's eyes rolled up and he groaned in agony. Jimmy found a tin of salt. He pinched enough to pack into the bleeding wound, then grabbed a small ra rag rug from the hearth. He wrapped it around the injured leg. Hold it tight till the blood stops, he instructed. Then, turning to the littlest boy, he smiled. Your paw's going to be all right, sonny. Helps on the way. In, it, in the instant that Jimmy swung onto his horse, he decided not to return to Robert's Creek. He must warn his friends, but this made Jimmy feel sad inside. 
He had such understanding and love for Indian people. How could he possibly fight them? And that is the end of chapter six.